As I'm recording this, SBF is still out on bail. He has his own Substack. He has a Twitter account. I saw a few leaked messages that he's actually contacting witnesses and people who are involved in FTX, trying to influence them, trying to get in touch. So he's working hard in the background. What is funny is the latest news I read is that FTX actually asked the politicians that SBF donated money to, to give the money back, which is really funny because he donated millions, including Democrats, Republicans in the US, and I think the Biden campaign. He was the second largest donor. It would be really interesting to see how that pans out. I don't like politicians too much, so this is really funny to me. I'm wondering who has to give the money back and if there's maybe legal action that's going to be taken. I've read some things, so this would be interesting to see. In this video, I'm going to revisit the New York Times interview. This was right in the beginning. He was still in the Bahamas. This was before he was arrested in the Bahamas for the first time and before he was extradited to the US and then obviously released on bail. So this was the first real interview, the first main stream media interview with the New York Times that kind of started his whole media run. Then he did all the other podcasts and all the other interviews. I've actually been thinking about what he was thinking, why he thought that this wouldn't go wrong, or maybe even now he thinks this didn't go bad, but I actually doubt that. I actually think he does think it went really poorly. But I think in his mind, he kind of thought that connections will always save you. If he pays it forward, literally, if he pays off all these politicians, all these partnerships and celebrities, and also the media companies, Companies. If he has all of these connections, they will save him in some way. And they still might. He's still working in the background. They still might save him to some degree. So I think this was his first thought. Connections will save you. Then I think he probably also thought that all of his political donations is going to give him influence so that these people actually pick up the phone when he calls and they will do him favor because he paid them, which might be true, might not be true. Maybe the whole process of him being arrested right before he was supposed to give the testimony was kind of him pulling a stunt where he had people pull strings in the background. I don't know, maybe people were trying to protect him against his own will or following his own will. Then this is a big one that I think a lot of fraudsters fall into. They think that they can be too big to fail. If this company has raised, let's say, Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes, we raised so and so many hundreds of millions, our valuation is so and so high, we are too big to fail. I think a lot of companies think that. Look at Worldcom or Enron, some really old cases of bankruptcies. This is a big thing. If things are moving and you have a lot of money, you have a lot of interest and you're operating at a very high level, at some point you think, I'm too big to be touched. Same as China and Alibaba CEO Jack Ma. He was critical of the Chinese government, probably thinking that he is too big to be touched and he can get away with being a little critical. He was wrong. He couldn't. So there's a saying, I think I'm too big to fail. This was for sure one of his delusions. And I think a pretty dumb one is that he probably thought that crypto wouldn't crash to that degree, that this wasn't possible. Obviously, if you look at the history of crypto, you should realize that there's always these cycles and there are always horrible crashes. But you could say the same thing about Three Arrows Capital, who also didn't think that this could go so wrong. So a lot of large companies in the crypto industry thought this wouldn't be possible, especially the ones that were in the area of lending money or taking these very risky bets. These companies, they thought this couldn't go wrong and it did go wrong. And the last delusion, if you don't keep proper books, you can't be found out. He didn't really keep proper books and they used disappearing messages. He used Slack a lot. He probably thought that if there's no definite proof that he willingly committed fraud, he can talk his way out of everything, which obviously isn't true. You don't have to come out and say, all right, people, I committed fraud in order to be convicted for fraud. You can be convicted for fraud even if you disagree with that. Okay, let's go into the interview. New York Times, one of the first interviews that SBF gave after FTX crashed. And at the end of the day, I, I was CEO of FTX. And that means whatever happened, why ever it happened, I had a duty. I had a duty to all of our stakeholders, to our customers, uh, our creditors. I had a duty to our employees, to our investors, and, and to the regulators in the world uh, to do right by them, to make sure the right things happened to the company. And uh, clearly, I didn't do a good job of that. Um, clearly, I um, I made a lot of mistakes or, or things I would give anything to be able to do over again. Um, I didn't ever uh, try to commit fraud on anyone. I I was excited about the prospects of FTX a month ago. Um, I saw it as a thriving, growing business. I was shocked by what happened this month, and you know, reconstructing it. Uh, where are there things I wish I had done differently? 
he appears so convincing, honestly. The way he says that, I was completely shocked what happened. You are not the 90% owner of Alameda Research and the CEO and founder of FTX. And then you're, oh my God, I'm completely shocked at what happened. You are the one person who should know before the public knows. But he's presenting it as if his car is rolling off a cliff. He leaves the car, goes into the crowd, and then stands there with the people in the crowd and says, oh, I have no idea this is going to happen. No, you're the person who's supposed to control the car. You're not the person who's outside in the crowd and he's like, amazed and thinking oh my god this whole thing crashed this is crazy but he's really pretending to be a little boy who made a mistake and is apologizing like a big boy he says look i made mistakes i think i really did wrong i was completely amazed i was completely baffled that this happened wow this was crazy let's move on he's going back to the playbook the whole incompetence thing and again the shifting the blame i always find it interesting how he didn't really get to shift the blame we haven't seen the cat fight between all of the founders and all of the management team where caroline ellison and sbf are all fighting against each other because he still says that it was his responsibility that the right things happen at the company which means that it wasn't his fault he didn't do anything he didn't control his people correctly and the people are at fault he always uses the same language he has toned it down now now he's mostly blaming the new ceo john ray and obviously the law firm behind him and he's saying that fdx us is completely solvent and they're actually stealing the money because they pay their legal fees with customer funds which honestly probably is true because how do you get the legal fees fees from FTX you have to use customer funds this is what all they did I can see why they have to do that because somehow they have to pay the legal fees I guess you could expect the government to pay these fees because the government actually should have the incentive to make sure that all the companies are healthy imagine FTX has failed and instead of the money having to come from FTX for the legal fees it comes from the government now the government actually would have an incentive to make sure that all the companies let's say operating in the US would not be fraudulent they couldn't just ignore them and they couldn't just take their political donations without asking questions. But that's an interesting thought. Who should pay for the legal fees? Because right now it seems like it is customer funds because FTX probably doesn't have any other money. So this kind of messed up as well. But this doesn't mean that SPF is innocent in any way. Just because his mess is cleaned up in a messy way doesn't make his mess less bad. Uh, I want to read to you, Sam, um, because it's from a gentleman who said that he lost his life savings. Um, and the subject line is, Sam Bankman-Fried stole $2 million from me. Says, Andrew, can you please ask SBF why he decided to steal my life savings and the $10 billion more from customers to give to his hedge fund, Alameda? Can you ask him why his hedge fund was leveraging long all of these S-coins? I'm going to keep it polite for the kids. Shit coins is what he's talking about. Here you can see how he is acting. SPF, in my opinion, definitely is acting because as soon as it comes to, all right, here's a message from someone. This is a person who lost their life savings. So it's very, very sad. He knew that this is the cue. As soon as he heard someone lost their life savings, this was his acting cue. He looked down and he looked like this is a sad moment. He has to take a second to make sure that, okay, this is an emotional topic. But as soon as he makes the joke about the S coin, because he didn't want to say shit, Shitcoin because he didn't want to be demonetized as I might be, but he makes a joke. So it's a very mild joke, but the topic is still bad, right? But now you can see how he's acting because as soon as he cracks the joke, he cracks his act and suddenly he starts laughing. If this is a sad topic, let's say you go to a doctor with someone, even if you just barely know the person, it's an acquaintance, and they're diagnosed with cancer right in front of you, and then the doctor cracks a joke, you're not going to be the one who's like, oh, this is hilarious. You're going to laugh loudly. You're still going to look at that person. How are they taking this? Because it's not about you. You shouldn't laugh in a situation that's already sad, but the way he grins there, this this tells me that he really doesn't care, which obviously a lot of CEOs probably wouldn't care, even the ones that are not fraudulent. But still, we all know he's acting. In the DMs that were leaked, he blatantly says that he's acting when he talks altruism and so on. He's still acting, so he's still doing the same thing. We shouldn't be surprised, and we definitely shouldn't say, maybe he's actually a good guy. Maybe he actually feels remorse. He looked very remorseful. No, at the first mild joke, he was desperate to laugh at this. And it's not like he's laughing and he's trying to hide it. He's laughing and he's grinning at the interview. It's like, oh, are we talking fun now? Is the sad part over? Can we skip this now? If I had caused someone to lose their life savings, I'll be really, really sad. Especially if this wasn't a risky investment, this was a custody thing. So I was supposed to keep money safe. It wasn't my right to use that money. If someone invests all of their life savings in Wirecard, which was a German fraud, and they have completely undiversified 
pension plan, which is I put all of my money into this one company and it turns out to be a fraud. This is dumb. You know this was a risky investment. You didn't diversify your portfolio. It's still sad, but it's not on the same level. But someone had to have custody over the money. They misused that and betrayed the user base. This is a different thing. I wouldn't laugh like that. This is 100% your fault. You should feel responsible. And this grin tells me he doesn't feel responsible at all. Please ask him if he thinks the thinks what happened was fraud. Now the smile disappears. It's also funny if someone says that you might have committed fraud. This is what we talk about now. Now he has been charged by everybody, the FTC, the SEC for multiple counts of fraud. At this point, we didn't know how the legal system was going to react. It reacted kind of well, but now it's kind of slow. So let's see how it goes on. But at this point, it was all a little in the air. It's a margin trading platform. It's a derivatives platform. It's a platform where all the clients were, you know, going on, placing something as collateral and using that to put on a position, whether that's a futures position, a spot position, a borrow. Um, and, you know, what the exchange was storing was the collateral from all of those positions. Uh, Alameda Research was, you know, one of those that put on positions there. It's funny to see how he has evolved. He, of course, practiced his excuses a lot in the interviews and also offline for sure. So this is all about the co-mingling of the funds. This was before the term co-mingling of the funds was really placed on him because at that point, he always used the excuse that, yeah, all the people that put the assets in there, they were actually asking for it because they put all of the assets in this very risky margin account. So it's not our fault that it went away. So this was his first excuse that all of these assets were in these very risky accounts and they were asking for it because they should have known the risk. But of course, this wasn't the truth because most of the users of FTX didn't opt in to this margin account. So you know the story. And as we know now, the big secret obviously was that Alameda Research had an infinite ability to borrow money from FTX with zero collateral. So it doesn't matter at all what the users signed up for, what the users wanted to do, because Alameda Research could just pocket all of the money and there was no restriction. This is the fraud. They just took all the money, no collateral, no problem, and there were no rules stopping them or protecting the users. Both didn't exist. There is the borrow lending facility where users were lending billions of dollars of assets to each other, um, you know, collateralized by assets on the exchange. Um, you had, uh, and you had obviously futures contracts where there are leveraged positions on. Now, of course, all of this, um, it, it's meant to be the case that these are positions where FTX could, uh, if it needed to, margin call those positions and close them down in time such that it would cover all of those, uh, you know, all those shorts, all those liabilities. Obviously, that wasn't the case here. And that's a massive failure of oversight of risk management um, and of uh, you know, diffusion of responsibility from, from myself running FTX. It's so funny that he says it's an oversight failure because what I would be curious, is there any other entity or individual on this platform that had a margin account that was able to do that? I would for sure say the answer is no. I haven't heard anyone ask him that question if there was any other exception outside of Alameda Research for the margin account because the whole point of a margin account is you give me money, I give you collateral so that you know if I can't pay you back, then you have my collateral and you can just sell that collateral and you get your money back. So you lend me money, but you're never going to face any risk because you have collateral. Alameda Research had no collateral. They just stole all the money. To say it's an oversight failure once again says that this is not my fault. I just should have paid attention. This sounds like something that is decided at the beginning. It's not like, oh, we have a margin account. Let's just see how it goes. And then we monitor it. And at some point we're going to do something. Because if you think about it, they have all of these numbers on the database. How much money did Alameda Research borrow? How much collateral is there? They have all of these numbers, it was just a software backdoor that for sure had to be introduced. Because if you have some simple software that checks these accounts, if there's enough collateral, this should be used for everything. But Alameda Research had an exception. So my question would be, was there any other entity that was also under collateralized? Because I would think there wasn't. And can someone please do a remix of SBF talking about the borrow lending facility? Because he has this weird rhythm when he's talking. He has this eerily pleasant voice when he's explaining something something. He has a very agreeable, pleasant voice. Someone has to do a remix when he talks about the borrow lending facility, about Alameda Research, about the margin account, about the risk management. That would be hilarious. And I would also be very curious to know who was responsible for these margin account checks or for, the, let's say, the oversight in the margin accounts. And wasn't all of this software driven? Because if all of that is software driven, then it's an obvious fraud, which it is, we know. But he's pretending that a software company has a monkey in the basement who actually manually has 
has to track all of these things. Of course, for something like a margin account, you're going to have software check that because this is a very easy thing to do if you're working as an exchange and with assets all day anyway. You know, what it seems like happened is in the middle of the year, um, uh, a lot of, you know, most of the borrow lending desks in the space blew out or closed down. And um, it seems like Alameda had, you know, margin positions opened with them and that it likely moved a bunch of that over to FTX uh, this year when they shut down. And that means, you know, I, I think it was over collateralized um, positions, um, but positions that involve substantial size and substantial US dollar size on the borrow side. This is such an interesting detail because what he's saying is Alameda Research, this is now completely independent from FTX, just Alameda Research had margin accounts with other entities. These margin accounts with other entities had to be closed down. But if these margin accounts were closed down, it basically means either Alameda Research gives the money back to them or these entities are going to liquidate the collateral that Alameda Research gave them. So they had two options, pay back or we sell your collateral and we get our money back this way. And what SBA is kind of glossing over is that he's saying that we took these margin accounts and we just onboarded them or we just took them in. But that means that they basically bought out Alameda Research. According to SBF, these two companies were completely separate. You have Alameda Research and on the other side, you have FTX. So why would they buy out Alameda Research? They have different margin accounts and take all of them in. This doesn't make any sense. If these two entities are completely separate, why would you buy them out? And this goes back to them holding FTT, this token, FTX token called FTT. They held that as collateral. And if Alameda their research was forced to liquidate all of that collateral that they had, then FTX would suffer because this would drop their own token price. But of course, this later happened when CZ did his tweet. So they were trying to avoid that. But I think this little point that you just glossed over that they bought out the margin accounts for Alameda Research, I think this is where everything went wrong. Because they already started out knowing that no matter what, Alameda Research, their collateral can't be liquidated. Otherwise, they wouldn't buy it. If there was no problem in Alameda Research liquidating the collateral, they wouldn't have bought them out. So they had a vested interest to make sure that this collateral is not liquidated. So when they took them in, it was the obvious next step to make sure that their collateral is not liquidated. So he says that this was over collateralized, meaning that they had way more collateral than whatever they borrowed, which obviously we know isn't true. But this was the first sign of problem. There's no reason to buy them out and to take them in and to then suddenly liquidate their collateral. You wouldn't do that. And this is the point where you had the unlimited ability to borrow money from the side of Alameda from FTX user funds. So for sure, you're not going to be the one who's liquidating their collateral. But, but it sounds like it's fair to say that, that there was always a connection between Alameda and FTX and, and almost, I mean, not almost, but from the very, very beginning. And then it never really stopped. Well, I think it had been in some ways reducing. I mean, when you scroll back to 2019, Alameda and FTX were very connected in a number of ways. Um, you know, one of these it was that Alameda was the primary liquidity provider on FTX. It was, you know, 40 something percent of volume. It was the backstop liquidity provider. Um, and, you know, you scroll forward to 2022, it was down to 2% of volume. Uh, we had a lot of backstop liquidity providers, um, uh, but it still had a big margin position on. And yeah, he says it became less in some ways. It's such a useless questioning if you're being so vague that you say that, oh, it was a lot in the beginning and it became less in some ways. But this is not about the market making. This is not about Alameda Research having a lot of different assets going on FTX and making sure that people can trade at all, making sure that if people want Bitcoin, they get Bitcoin from Alameda. If they want US dollar, they get US dollar from Alameda. So this is not about the market making part. This is about the borrowing part because here's the insane bit. Alameda Research had different margin accounts and they were all closed down. So FTX bought them out. FTX took their margin accounts. They said, okay, you now have a margin account with us. You give us the collateral and blah, blah, blah. So they took them over so they wouldn't liquidate. And here's the insane bit. After that was said, and it was clear that FTX didn't want to liquidate the collateral. This is why they bought them out. After this was clear, Alameda Research kept borrowing money. This is the insane bit. Because let's say you have a very risky scenario. You as a third party entity, which is FTX is worried that if Alameda Research sells their collateral and liquidates their collateral, they're going to suffer. 
So now you're in this weird bind where you don't want them to sell the collateral, but now they have a margin account with you. And now you're in a double bind because A, you don't want them to sell their collateral. B, they have a margin account. And if whatever they're borrowing is worth more than what they give you as collateral, then you should liquidate that, but you can't. So this is a double bind. But then this insane part where they keep borrowing money. As FTX, you would say, okay, this is bad enough. We can't have you liquidate this and you're already under collateralized. This is a problem, but we definitely can't give you more money. This is the one thing we can't do, but they still allowed them to borrow money. This is the insane part. I can't see how he doesn't go to prison. This is just so dumb. But does that just suggest that you were just hoping, perhaps hoping against hope that this would all work out and that nobody therefore would realize what this commingling was all about? So it's not how I viewed it. And this is such a great introduction to giving an answer where you just say, this is not how I viewed it. We think you committed fraud. Actually, I see this differently. I actually have a different explanation. It doesn't matter what he says afterwards. He's just going to talk about, well, there's a borrowed lending facility. There's a margin account. It's funny how his tune has changed. He really goes heavy on saying that, hey, FTX US is solvent. They're stealing the money. I actually wonder that he thinks that he has political influence. But if FTX succeeds in getting money back from politics, and if politicians hate one thing, then it's to look bad because they need to be reelected. Politicians don't care about people. They care about the elections and the power they hold. Politicians will generally overreact because they want to make sure that they don't look bad. Looking bad is the worst for a politician. So if FTX is going to, let's say, take legal action and get the money back from the politicians, then SBF is going to be worse off than before because now he didn't help the politicians. He actually gave them a big headache and a big problem. So this would be very interesting to see play out how whatever support he now has is going to crumble down if this actually goes through. So this is a very interesting development. I'm going to split it up two parts. See you in the next video.